In June 2020, a routine demolition of a barn in Cape Breton Island, Nova Scotia took an unexpected twist. As the barn came down, a cache of hidden objects tumbled out from behind a false wall. They were strange and ominous, including a massive crucifix and a child-sized coffin. On When Walls Come Tumbling Down, we tell the story of these mysterious objects, the people who hid them, and the haunting ritual in which they were used. Mixed marriages were absolutely frowned upon and it could split a family. Its existence uh, wasn't known. So you, you couldn't see it. It was like a false wall. How do we take this to the community and share it with them? You were looking at history here. Historia Canadiana is recorded on the unceded lands of the Kanyan Kaheka First Nation. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Historia Canadiana, the show where we talk about Canadian history, literature, and culture in general on the air and behind the scenes. We talk about revolutionary suicide, which is always fun. Let's go questioning the meaning of life with my boy Albert Camus. Um, my name is Patrick, and with me, as always, is my co host, Mackenzie. Yo, 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 yo. Let's talk about the Quebec countryside. Which, shockingly, we haven't ever talked about. We've always just been, like, Montreal-focused, I feel. Unless I'm misremembering an episode or remembering or not just completely ignoring one. But I feel like that's, like, a blind spot. But uh, I might be forgetting that. Maybe you can fill me in. But I imagine you probably don't remember either. Anyway. We definitely talked about Quebec rural as an idea. But we've never mm. been focused within the specifics of that idea. It's fair. That's absolutely fair. Yeah. And as you can tell by the title of this episode, we're going to be doing it through a classic Quebec novel, uh, Maria Chapdelaine by Louis Aimon, which I think still to this day is considered a classic. But go ahead. You're muted, by the way. Away! Marie, That's Marie! It. That's the, all the French that you're going to say. This entire episode. I know. Okay. That was all the French I said my mother would kill me. <laughs> right. Um, so for people who want to follow along on the book, there is a digitized copy on archive.org that you can follow in. I think it's only in French. I don't think there's a French version on... Uh, it's only in English. I don't think there's a French version on archive.org, but I might be wrong. Both are really good. There's a really great translation of it, and the French is classic. Before we get into that, um, I do want to obviously thank our lovely patrons, right, and encourage people to support us either for a dollar or three dollars a month, and they get things like ad-free episodes or extra episodes, and just the general well-being of supporting two podcasters who just do it for the fun of it, right? So mm -hmm. consider it; it's fun. We you get to hear an extra episode of Pop Canada every Ooh. month. So, Pop Canada. Hell yeah. Um, okay. So, getting into Maria Chapdelaine, as someone who did do their education, at least partially in Quebec, is this a book that ever came up for you? No. Really? Never? Not even once? No. <laughs> I'm My shocked. high school was very, like, private school independent most of our books were more like international focused we never read any canadian literature to be honest you didn't even have like a french prof or anything like that who mentioned it i'm i'm genuinely what, in my surprised english lit degree that. yeah it's true like i don't know if you had to take a french class i don't know no all right like even in my like quebec literature classes we were mostly focusing on an anglo literature Right, right. Anglo-Quebec literature, which is fine. That's also good. But yeah, I I could not get through, I think, any of my years in French high school and French CGEP without at least one prof a semester or a year mentioning mm. this novel, right? It is like the Quebec terroir novel um, that has kind of solidified what that is, right? And also it was kind of like the last great one because after that, the others have kind of been like forgotten to time, right? mm -hmm. <laughs> which is, it kind of peaked with Maria Chabdelen. <laughs> um, and before we get into that, I just want to give it a little bit of context, although the history part of it is not going to be as long as I think our literary discussion of it is. 
because a lot of these things are things that we've talked about either in passing as part of a wider discussion or that are in the midst of being developed in Canada at this time. So it's not, we can't really develop it that much, right? Or I don't want to go into that much detail with the history. Mm -hmm. um, so Maria Chapdelen itself would be published in 1914 in France and in Quebec in 1916. So right around this time in Quebec, specifically, we're just coming out of Wilfrid Laurier's tenure as prime minister, right? So a couple of years ago in 1911, he would have ended. And if you recall from our episode on Wilfrid Laurier, Mac, he kind of slowly petered out through a series of controversies and people who kind of lost more and more confidence in the Liberal Party. And so the first French Canadian PM was just kind of like fizzled away and distrusted. Mm -hmm. Um, which made a lot of people in Quebec kind of anxious about their future within Canada, but also fearful of the Liberal Party itself, right? Like what it represented. Those dang liberals. Kind of, yeah. Like there's a reason why for a while in Quebec, what you heard a lot is the slogan, yeah, I'm roughly translating here, but in French it would be L'enfer est rouge et le ciel est bleu. And so this translates for people who don't speak French to hell is red and heaven is blue, right? Or mm -hmm. the sky is blue. And what that was supposed to represent were the colors of the liberal red party and conservative blue party. Right? And this was something that especially the clergy in Quebec would kind of say or prone as an idea and a lot of that stems from the failures of French Canadian uh, politicians like Wilfrid Laurier to represent Quebec's interests within the wider Canadian sphere. Right? Mm -hmm. um, but that's on a more national level. Uh, within the province, what we're seeing more and more in, in this particular time is very much a debate on modernization, which you see pretty much everywhere right? Because it's the late 19th century, early 20th century. It's modernize or die, baby. <laughs> so yeah. modernize or die. Like literally, that's how it, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm being hyperbolic in this case, but I feel like that's how a lot of it has, shine, has shown through over time. Mm. You could disagree with me on that. I don't know, but yeah. Um, no, go ahead. Sorry. You looked like you were going to say something. I feel like I was, but no, it's, it's, it's one of the, it's one of those really interesting things where how Quebec puts itself in, in opposition with others, you know, it's okay. this case of modernize or die. So it's sort of, no, where it gets everything Anglo, but then the Anglos are like, but we're offering modernization and improved living quality. And the Quebec, the Quebec will have to be like, fuck you anyway. We don't want your better living quality <laughs> modernization. What's wrong with our farms? <laughs> I just want to farm. Look, because we always get messages from a variety of listeners whenever we make fun of Quebec, I do want to specify in this case that we're doing this as people who were both born and raised, or you weren't born here, but uh, raised at the very least in Quebec, right? I I want to specify this, that like, I'm I laughing because I can. Many of my summers in rural country in Quebec. Right. And I also want to specify that, like, just because we're making fun of Quebec in this case for not, or for having a debate on modernization, this also happened elsewhere in Canada, right? And but, we make fun of everybody. We make fun yeah. of ourselves. But I think your point, despite the fact that this happened elsewhere in Canada, I think your point is well taken that this is something that is emblematic well, this is, of yeah, yeah this is always going to exactly. lie at the crux of any oppositional like this isn't just special to anglo and franco quebec this is any sort of oppositional know. forces canada versus america too canada versus the exactly. u.s where it's this idea of like we don't want to be like you but we have to acknowledge that the things that you do well yes exactly right so it's one of those things that yeah, exactly. It happens on many other levels, but you just kind of want to focus mm -hmm. on that in particular. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and then in this case in particular, it's just popping out as like 
we're going to be anti-modernization or whatever. And the Anglos have to be, well, we're going to be anti-rule. And it's like, those are both stupid opinions to have. Right, exactly. Because <laughs> um, you still need farms, right? You want to grow your crops, my dude. <laughs> well, it's also, you know, like people like living out in farmland. It's nice living out in farmland. Exactly. Yeah. And part of this debate was, again, centered around the Liberal Party, which tended to be the party on a provincial level in this case, that was very much advocating the more urban uh, urbanization and uh, economic development of Quebec, right? And they were in power from the late 19th century in 1896 to the early 1930s in this case, so quite a long period of time. Um, and a lot of the way that they sought to develop the Quebec economy and modernize Quebec was through foreign investment, right? So you've got another kind of, uh, how could I say it? Like another way in which a kind of anti-liberal sentiment can form is because, oh, there are foreigners now that are involved, right? Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's British investment or French investment or investment from literally anywhere, right? In this case, it's like, oh, what kind of power do they have over us Quebecois, right? Um, which obviously in this case would lead to not only uh, suspicion from the clerics, right? Who saw traditional values being eroded with modernization, mm -hmm. but also just nationalists, right? Who saw this as a problem for not being able to be quote unquote maître chez nous, right? Masters in our own home, which is a uh, term that would come up later in Quebec nationalist discourse in the 60s and 70s, but whose development very much stems in this time, right? Mm -hmm. um, and basically, you also see the nat the rising of the argument of the liberals squandering national resources, right? So this association of nature with nationalism, right? And being part of the natural landscape, um, Being part so of the national order. Up. Yep, a hundred percent. Right. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I just thought this was good to mention in this case. I don't know if you had anything to add about like how this particular nationalist movement emerged in this case. I feel like it's pretty typical, but I wanted to leave you space if you wanted to add anything in this particular case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Map. Yes, about the particular cases of nationalism. You know, like if you had anything in particular to add in this case, but I feel like it's pretty typical. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we've talked about nationalism before on this podcast ad nauseum, just because it is such a recurring exactly. theme in Canadian history. Yeah, which is why I'm so, kind of skipping over it. Yeah, exactly. And the, this is just another flavor of Quebec nationalism. This is the Ben and Jerry's rural farmland <laughs> flavor of it. <laughs> Perfect. So, uh, while it's the, the, the end of the liberal reign in Quebec, that's, that's so stupid. I'm sorry. It's the Ben and Jerry's <laughs> in Quebec Nash. <laughs> no, it's the Ben, it's, you know, because Ben and Jerry's have all those fucking flavors, and it's like, yeah, they're all different, but they're also all the goddamn same. <laughs> because they're all ice cream. <laughs> yeah, they're all some kind of chocolate swirl butternut squash cherry ripple bullshit it's the, industrial same it's the same with nationalism it's all just different flavors of the same bullshit exactly whether it be franco right. swirls with angle chocolate chips and like that's not to say that there's no value to it right to, to no not to, at all but it just there's some special. value to <laughs> exactly exactly there's some value to it in so far as like you want to determine the uniqueness of a particular people but yeah exactly it's, yeah. it follows and a pretty similar pattern you want to determine the uniqueness of ben and jerry's <laughs> <laughs> so uh, well, commentary all as always truly enlightened <laughs> thank god i put this podcast on my cv <laughs> some professor's so, gonna be sitting there ben and jerry's <laughs> what the fuck <laughs> They mostly do it for the interviews, but whatever. Yeah. Um, so the the whole point um, in this case that I want to make is that the 
while this particular period goes a little bit outside of the purview of when Maria Chapdelaine takes place as a novel in the early 20th century, um, I do think the dynamics that are happening in this case are still important to highlight. And by the end of the 1930s, right, in 1936, 37, that's when you would see the rise of um, people like Maurice Duplessis, right, uh, who would be a very conservative figure in Quebec politics and Quebec society as a reaction to the type of policies that were implemented by the Liberal Party at this time, right? And Maurice Duplessis' values very much embodied this back to the land, uh, masters in our own place, uh, rhetoric that you see sometimes for the benefit in this case of Quebec economically, they did really, really well under Maurice Duplessis. Um, but, you know, in other cases, as far as culture and tradition was concerned, it was rather intense, right? And kind of stifled mm -hmm. Quebec culture for a long time, um, which is why that period during Maurice Duplessis' reign, which we will talk about, is known as the Great Darkness in Quebec, right? Um, oh, yes. <laughs> Him I do know about. We did learn there about you go. in school. I'm sure. He's he's a character. Mm, <laughs> Certainly. That's one way for it. <laughs> um, but yeah, and honestly, like this, I, I don't know if you had anything to add about this particular historicization, but that's pretty much all I wanted to mention for this particular novel today i mean right trying to think because this is just so what year is this 19 the novel came out in 1916 so right around it was during world war one but yeah. yeah kind of well because even if you're talking well. in the time right like from a historical perspective the time before that this this really is going to be a question like nationalism is on everybody's mind because nationalism then relates this is still when Canada was forced to fight the Queen's Wars, the Crown's Wars. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that's definitely like a big point of contention, to put oh, it yeah. lightly. So I and... think any any sentiments that go either way have to be put in context, like because there was a very hot topic issue to tentpole this all around. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because even before like World War One had started, there were still like people knew this was starting to happen tensions were on the rise in europe yeah. yeah and it's it's actually interesting because it's on national bases that quebec would refuse to join the war or like mm -hmm. vote or like have riots against conscription in world war one was on a nationalist yeah. basis because they didn't want to fight for the british right yeah um so in this case it's more of a positive form of nationalism but yeah i think that's a very good point in this case of bringing up the war which we should talk about soon. I think if not the next episode, then like in one or two episodes. So cool. Mm -hmm. um, bit of a sizzle reel, I guess, for that. <laughs> um, okay. So We're I want to talk a little world bit. War. We're finally getting into the 20th century. Yay! <laughs> Things are about to God heat damn. up and we're about to get to literature that I've read. Exactly. I remember when we first started this show... I was like, oh, is there anything in particular you'd want to talk about? And you were like, the only book I know in this case is Barometer Rising. And that yeah. was like a hundred episodes down the <laughs> list. Yep. And it's related to World War One. Oh, God, it's so funny. We spent a um, lot of time in the 1860s. Oh, yeah. I'm not going to apologize for it. With um, our boy Johnny A. McDee's Nuts McDonald. Anyway, the author of Maria Chapdelaine is, ironically enough, not Québécois, right? Despite oh. writing like the pinnacle, the peak of Québécois literature at that time, he comes from France, which is ironic. That tracks for Canada. That honestly tracks for Canadian literature and media. Oh yeah, for a long time it very much does. Um, like to how be many fair, times have we seen that happen? Like it happened in Acadia. Felt like it happened out west. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like early Canadian literature is super imported, right? Um, unless you want to. I mean, read Jack London stuff. wrote *Call of the Wild*, which is all about the Yukon Gold Rush, and he's American. There you go. To be fair, at least Louis Amon did live in Quebec. He just mm -hmm. was not born there. 
Um, he was born in France. He moved to Paris uh, with his family when he was still young. And he did do some military service, after which he moved to England, where he worked as a writer, and married a woman named Lydia O'Kelly, and with whom he had a child who was also named Lydia. But he would leave both Lydias behind um, with her family in England in order to set sail for the snowy land of Canada, right? Um I'm sorry, I shouldn't laugh, but your face when you're just about to sneeze is probably one of the funniest things I've seen. <laughs> so yeah, he would come to... I'd say cute, but whatever. Yeah, why not? Um, so he came to Canada in 1911, in this case, and he was still quite young. And he would spend short periods of time in Quebec City and Montreal, and he worked mostly for an insurance company. But he would pretty quickly insurance. go up Let's go, baby. Family business. The most fun-sounding employment of all time as a bilingual stenographer for an insurance company. Listen, Good God. As, as, mm. as somebody who's quite literally a son of an insurance person, there are, <laughs> much, there are many, many, many worse jobs. I'm sure. I'm sure. I guess it depends what you do in the insurance company. Like, yeah. That's true. I'm sure the accountants are having fun. <laughs> um, so he would eventually go up north to the Lac Saint Jean area, right? Um, and and on a farm. yeah, he basically decided to work this on a farm, go from insurance to working on a farm. Movie. I know, I know. Just drop everything to work on a farm to find yourself this is once the plot more. Of a- this is the plot of games I've played. Like, this is quite literally the plot of a game I have played. It's the game. Stardew Valley. Oh, okay. I've heard the name. Yeah, it's uh, literally a farming game where you drop everything, leave a, leave a corporation, and go, like, take over your grandfather's farm. Like, like I'm sure you've. there's plenty of people who did that in Quebec. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> or, or like just anywhere. in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes life just imitates art. Sure, I'm sure Louis Amon played Stardew's Stardew whatever. No, but I'm, t- I'm but I mean, like this isn't this is a story. This is a type of story that's been around for a yeah. long time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, absolutely. And it helped as well that right around the time that he was doing this in the early 20th century, the Quebec government was highly encouraging people to go up north. Right. Um, and still does. Right. When you look at miners, for example, who are sent uh, who are sent up north to the Northwest Territories or in northern Quebec. Right. The Yukon, all of that. They get fat checks. Right. And that's part of the incentive for them to go towards this rather inhospitable land. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and part of Quebec's and you see this in Ontario as well around the same time. Right. Part of these two provinces, colonial project would be to expand more towards the north Um, because there's mining resources. You can convert people. um, You know, you can bait people with the promise of free land or stolen land, right? Whichever you want to use as a term, right? And so it would be around this time, actually, 1910s, 1920s, that the province of Quebec would actually find the geography that it has today because before that, it was really just the south. Um, that was the province of Quebec. And it's during, I think it's officially in like 1920 or 21 that it would actually drop, become what we know it as today, right? This big ass province that holds like seven Frances in it. Um, so anyway, it's during his time on a farm in Lac Saint-Jean that he would write Marie Chapdelaine, which is the novel mm. we're talking about. Um, he would send his script back to France to get it published. Because, of course, there were no book publishers in Lac Saint-Jean um, at the time. Because it w- still is a dead area. <laughs> um, and, no, I'm sure there's book publishers, but whatever. Um, and he then set out to Western Canada. But, unfortunately for him, he got hit by a train and died. So, this, like... <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. <laughs> it's just the way I said it. Yeah. 
<laughs> but he was killed by a train and died. The note I have is a train mishap, but he just he got smacked by a train. Um, a train he... mishap. <laughs> 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 There was a spit of a <laughs> splatter situation with the train. Um, like all jokes, all jokes aside, like it is a rather tragic end for a very promising writer because he was only thirty three at this point. Um, he was still very young, even for the time. Um, and yeah, he had written a bunch of other books as well, but even Maria Chabdelen was not published in his own lifetime. Right. All his books are posthumously published um, in this case. So he never got to see the success of his books realized, um, especially not, of course, the one that we're talking about today. Right. Um, okay, let's get into the book then. Yes, Unless let's... you had anything to add about his train mishap. <laughs> I just, I don't know what it is. I just think it's funny, like, has this big accidental crisis, goes north, start to work on a farm he's writing books living his best life and then boom train and you know <laughs> what it it calls to mind the writing of albert camus elaborate please <laughs> he found meaning in his life and then death came anyway it's it's the randomness chance of it all it sort of really calls into question just you know, he had this storybook life that he was finding for himself almost. Yeah. And then chance, just random chance. But that's the thing. I don't know if we could maybe talk about this more later, but like it's still up to debate whether it was chance. Some people argue it might have been suicide. Um, so that really is Albert Camus and revolutionary suicide yes. then. Yes. He died for right? his art. But like, yeah, but it's it's really up to debate because a lot of people are like the train accident doesn't really make much sense. Like all the security measures were in were in place as far as I know. So like it unless something just is lost in translation over the records, like it's very possible that he just killed himself. Um which yeah, very sad, of course. Yourself. Um yeah. Um okay. So how do you want to start this discussion of the book? I guess we could start by establishing like what what would you consider this book to be like as far as a genre? We talked about realism last episode, but like how would you qualify this book? Um God. I like yeah, I guess it starts to fall into that life, like that slice of life realism. Mm -hmm. It's also, I don't know, it's I guess it's a bit of a romance. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's a like a, a love triangle. It's a it's a realism romance. Mm. We'll get into it later when we talk about it, but I want to talk about the economics of marriage within the book. Oh, yes. Definitely. Yeah. So in French, we call it a roman de terroir, which literally translates to novel of the earth, right? Or earth novel. Would, oh, pastoral. Would be what it, pastoral. Yeah, I guess it would be pastoral. Yeah. Yeah, there that's true. Go. So how would you qualify a pastoral for listeners who might not know? Um... A pastoral is out in the pastures, to put it lightly, to put it one way. It is a story that is taking place, like, entrenching itself within the countryside. The city as an entity is mm -hmm. removed only as the place of the other. Yes. The city is a place of being otherness, where we do not, we don't talk about the city. The city is the bad place, almost. And instead, we are entrenched in the beautiful rural countrysides and the lives of the people within it. Absolutely. And especially it's about removing ourselves from not just the city, but in other times, nobility, the yeah. trappings of courts and the trappings of society it is very much a society laid bare. Oh yeah. In the pastoral. Yeah. And isn't the pastoral something that's uh, been around for like centuries at years. this point? Oh, yeah, hundreds of yeah, yeah. the past as long as stories have been told, there's been the pastoral versus the city. Yeah, we like see very it in like Shakespeare, as far back as Greek. See it. Yeah. Oh God, yeah. The Greeks were yeah. doing it. It's like there's all because it's just it's just a difference in setting, and setting will yeah. always determine story. Exactly. Yeah. hundred so, percent. Yeah. 
Yeah, you like we can. Shakespeare is a huge fan of discussing the differences of pastoral to city. Um, one of my favorite plays of all time, The Countryman's Wife. Deals oh with, yeah, like pastoral for yeah yeah. This is a play that only the lit nerds know. It is like, <laughs> it is like the it is like the the first major milestone of being a literature nerd is reading The Countryman's Wife. Yeah, absolutely. It, it is. One the of country my favorite wife. plays. Is it the countryman's the country, wife or the country The countryman's wife. I thought it was. I thought it was the country wife. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Anyway, it's great. The point is, it's great. Oh, uh, it's the country <laughs> wife. Okay. It's the country wife. But still, pastoral. still, pastoral, great play. One of the one of the one of my favorite. It is peak comedy. I swear to God. Oh, it's so funny. <laughs> it is <laughs> the, the porcelain discussion. I swear to God. <laughs> oh god we're yeah such, we're such giant nerds like and there's no way to describe it like you just kind of have to you can find a free version of it online like i'm sure you, even yeah anyone who likes this show would probably like it but anyway uh, anyway any who any howitzer but yeah like the pastoral is i think a good way of describing this and yeah pastoral romance of course right so yeah. you have this mix of you know, love seeking love, right? But which should not be con- pastoral romance should not be confused with romantic pastoral. No, <laughs> Two very it different. is not the same thing. No, I wouldn't call this book romantic necessarily. No, right? Um, it is, it is a romance. Yes, romance in the sense of love, not romance no. in the sense that it's uh, not romantic in the sense that it's idealizing necessarily this place. Although yeah, it is, exactly. but it is still a bit critical of this whole environment right which is i think what makes it good i mean critical but also the virtues of it are very much in place sort of in the way, yeah. same way when we read uh sunshine sunshine sketches yes another like one of my favorite pieces of canadian literature is sunshine sunshine sketches for sure and this is like yeah, if people exactly. remember that episode having a little bit of callback in channel lore that is very much it's a it's a the the way the book portrays the small town is very similar and it very much discusses like virtues but also criticisms and there's a lot going on oh yeah just because it becomes emblematic of something and you're right just because there's a, a virtuousness that's associated or a virtue that's associated with the pastoral imagery of rural quebec here doesn't mean that it's perfect or imperfect Mm -hmm. right there's there's kind of a middle ground yeah Mm -hmm. well it really works into the idea of the pastoral in that it's about being honest yes it's very good yeah yeah you know say more about that okay well we see this any any countryside writing any countryside story and we see this even in modern day we'll discuss this idea if you're talking in the pastoral in the rural there's always a theme of honesty Mm. people are who they say they are things are at face value it's why, like, whenever city people have a story of going to the pastoral, it's about them finding themselves because you cannot. And that's why the city and the courts and society is the other in these stories, because those are the trappings of lies yeah. and illusion. We see this like Patrick's going to laugh, but I'm just going to say it. I'm saying it. And I know I'm right. Letter Kenny. <laughs> Letter yep. Kenny, like. To bring up another piece of great Canadian literature and entertainment, the show mm-hmm. Letterkenny is fully pastoral, and it's about that honesty of the small town, the honesty of the people who live in it. Yeah. And this, I it's think, tongue in cheek, but still, oh, it's all tongue in cheek. Like there's yeah. pastoral yeah. is defined by being tongue in cheek and just a little bit playful and satirical. Oh, from yeah. sun, from sunshine sketches of a small town to Letterkenny, that sounds <laughs> like the beginning of a Canadian literature essay that I would want to write. Yes. Let's collaborate Pastor- on that. That's awesome. <laughs> Pastoral satirization from Sunshine Sketches to Leonard Kenny. Oh, that's that perfect. That sounds like a, like a book or something. Yeah. But it is kind of funny to note as well. I played it wasn't... a book in my head. What have I become? <laughs> <laughs> but isn't it? It's kind of cool. Wasn't Sunshine Sketches also published the same year as Maria Chapdelaine in this case? Wasn't it also 1914 or 1916? Um, Oh, hold on. Uh, 1912. um, 1912. Okay. 
a little bit before. Okay. So mm-hmm. still, it is kind of cool that like in Canada, at least right. Or it's not entirely coincidental that right around the time of industrialization, the pastoral would become something that's, you know, more popular. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I want to come back to this idea of the romance because the pastoral and the romantic, or, or I should say the romance are very much intertwined as symbols in this particular mm-hmm. novel. And I think that's a good way to also describe what this novel is exactly. Um, because of course it's set in the Lac Saint-Jean region, right? Where Imon wrote the book. And it basically portrays a farmer's or a farmer family and their attempt to tame the harsh land. And in parallel to this, the titular Maria, who is the daughter mm-hmm. of the Chapdelaine family, right? Um, has to make a choice, right? After her, um, after the man that she loves died, she has to make the choice between marrying the uh, American uh, suave, handsome man, Lorenzo, or marry the farmer's, uh, the farmer next door's uh, son, Utrecht, which is a terrible name, but a very common mm-hmm. one at the time. I guess in English you would say Utrip, but I don't know. <laughs> um, and, you know, obviously Re- Lorenzo can bring her to the United States for a much easier life filled with, you know, industry and you know, prosperous economies. And Utrecht will offer her the same life that she has always known, right? but stability and, Mm -hmm. you know, a life on the land. And of course, who does she choose in the end after this love love triangle kind of develops? She ultimately does what, Mac? I don't know. You tell me. She stays on the land. She chooses to stay stay in Quebec and sacrifices herself. Yeah, she, yeah. There's a way of there's a few ways that you can analyze this, but some I think the most convincing one for me is that she sacrifices herself for the values of the family and the community to be able to perpetuate herself through family, right? And the mm-hmm. establishment of good old Quebecois um normative uh nuclear families on the farm. As Dom Toretto would say, it's all about family. In this case, quite literally, right? Because Utrup is literally just a copy pasted version of Maria's dad, but just from the farm next over. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, like, he's just the same thing. He represents the same values, right? You could probably have a whole discussion of like the Electra complex in this case, which is like the female version of the Oedipus complex for <laughs> that, right? Like you could probably have a whole thing, but we're not going to get into that today. But that's basically the story. And it's not a very long novel. It's like 200 pages long. And that's pretty much what happens. She decides to stay with the good old tradition. But what I think makes the novel so interesting is that it's actually genuinely well-written, right? And there's all kinds of subtext. And again, the way that Imol... The imagery and the metaphors, the metaphorical language is actually really just on point. Really good. Like Imol is genuinely a gifted writer. Yeah, yeah. We're yeah. going to get into some of the turns of and the the true telling of the strength of the writing is that it survives translation. Yes. Okay, yeah, that's really good. Yeah. Because it, this novel was really rich written in French. And so the fact that like he had a good translation translation team and a good editing team, I'm sure, but there are so many products and things that do not survive that translation. This is not one of those things. This thing survives and it flourishes within the English language as well. Absolutely. Like I was reading parts of it and you could easily forget that this is supposed to be a Francophone book. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Because his, his, well, his tone, his manner of speech is just so universal. Yeah. I, I wonder if part of that was because he didn't have anything to do with the editing process. Like I know there were different versions of the book that were produced before the original manuscript was produced. Right. Um, And the original manuscript is what was translated, but for a while, like people could basically do whatever with it because he was dead. Right. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if like that gave the text a bit of flexibility to breathe, but I'm not sure. Right. Um, I really don't know about its publication history enough to be able to say that with any certainty, but I don't know. (laughs) Um, okay. So, uh, 
I just wanted to mention, I'm just looking through here. I don't think there was anything else I wanted to mention before we got into the passages. Oh, yeah, I guess something else to mention in this case, just uh, for people to get a better sense of what the pastoral or the Ramans terroir can represent is usually is associated with four particular values, right? We already brought up agriculture and family, right? Mm. But as far as Quebec is concerned, well, you see this in other pastoral um, pastoral texts as well, like an emphasis on language, on preserving language, or at least on uh, using language quite interestingly is also a core uh, aspect of the pastoral. And of course, religion, right? The morality of it, is very intrinsic, I think, to the pastoral. Um, it's a moralistic type of writing uh, in many ways. Mm -hmm. right? um, whether it's subverting the morality or emphasizing it, the morality is necessary, I think, or a necessary quality of the pastoral. I don't know if you agree with me on that, but I think that that's true. No, I mean, the language. It makes it, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I agree with the language. Like I read that in one of the analyses and I put it in here, but I don't know if languages like that outside of Quebec is a mainstay of the pastoral, right? It might be for Quebec because French, but I can't say that pastoral mm. in general makes that much of an emphasis on language. On like the writing, of, the writing of the work? Or yeah, the writing of the work or just the use of the characters in the work themselves using language in interesting or particularly powerful way that feels like it's gonna be more of a quebec thing mm, yeah yeah all right just because language you want to start off a quebec thing maybe there are some things that are just quebec things and that's cool mm -hmm. <laughs> um okay do you want to start us off with a passage that you thought was particularly cool about the novel or interesting sure we picked similar ones actually so mine is on yeah. page two and the one you picked yeah. is right on page one so we can read both Sure. So um, where do you, why don't you start with yours talking about the church? Yeah. So mine is literally the one I chose here was literally just the opening segment mm -hmm. of the book here, um, which is, I think, again, works on two levels. One shows you the power of the writing, but also mm -hmm. introduces, I think, the elements that Louis Aimon is going to play with so well, right? Um, so here we go. Ite misa est. The door opened and the men of the congregation began to come out of the church at Peribonka. A moment earlier, it had seemed quite deserted. This church set by the roadside on the, the high bank of the Peribonka, whose icy snow-covered surface was like a wind, a winding strip of plain, the snow lay deep upon road and fields, for the April sun was powerless to send warmth through the gray clouds, and the heavy rain, spring rains were yet to come. This chill and universal white, the humbleness of the wooden church and the wooden houses scattered along the road, the gloomy forest ending so close that it seemed to threaten, these all spoke of a harsh existence in a stern land. I was like, yep, that's... There you go. As you were saying before we started recording, you kind of get immediately what the book is going to be about in like the first 10 pages. But I think also in this particular passage, you you get all the um all the uh the particulars of the pastoral, right? The church yeah. is obviously like the mainstay or the focus, right, around which mm -hmm. the community is uh centered. Um and of course the humbleness of these institutions, not only the church, but the wooden houses, right? They live simple lives. Um, but also there's a sense of threat that comes from nature, right? Despite the fact that people tie their lives to it and their existence to it, there's inevitably a threatening element to it that still haunts people even in the early 20th century as they're going up north, right? Like the threatening, the threatening clouds and stern land Right. So I really liked uh, that particular passage. And for people who don't know, uh, by the way, the opening line of the book, Ite Misa Est, is Latin um, in this case. And it 
basically is what was said at the end of a Roman Catholic service in this case. Um, it's a way to say like, okay, this is over and go in peace, basically. Um, All those Roman Catholics. Yeah, which again, you can kind of, you can kind of associate thematically with the rest of the novel. And I think that's a really interesting way to start off, right? Is to tell the people like, be free, right? And go out into the land. But of course, be most free. of them take the- Be free, right. little birds. You can go, but ironically, you have to stay around the church, right? So it, mm. it's a bit of a double-edged sword here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Did you have anything to add about this particular passage? I mean, I'll probably just add with my passage that comes yeah. literally just a page afterward because I think they sort of tie into each other. Good, good. So your passage was very much focused on the church and the importance of the church within the life. Mm-hmm. And I actually wanted to focus a bit more on that, the pastoral living, as it were. Oh, yeah, okay. So this happens all, oh, this is going to be, I'll be reading for a little bit, I guess, just from the top of page two almost. The young folk of the village, very smart and coached with otter collars, gave deferential greeting to old Neze Leroche, a tall man with gray hair and huge bony shoulders, who had in no wise altered from the mass his everyday garb. Short jacket of brown cloth lined with sheepskin, patched trousers, and thick woolen socks under moose hide moccasins. Well, Mr. Leroche, do things go pretty well across the water? Not badly, my lads, not so badly. Everyone drew his pipe from his pocket and the pig bladder filled with tobacco leaves cut by hand. And after the hour and a half of the shrink began to smoke with evident satisfaction. The first puffs brought talk of the weather, the coming spring, the state of the ice on Lac Saint-Jean and the rivers of their several doings in the parish gossip after the manner of men who living far apart on the worst of roads see one another but once a week. The lake is solid yet, said Cleophas Bézant, but the rivers are no longer safe. The ice went this week beside the sand bank opposite the island, where this has where this have been warm spring holes all winter. Others began to discuss the chances of the crops before the ground was even showing. I tell you that we shall have a lean year, asserted one old fellow. The frost got in before the last snow was fell. And then it sort of goes on, blah, 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 sort of, sort of like this. Now, my bad uh, Quebecois accent aside, no, that was really I, really like, I really like how this passage, like, they're talking about life and death in a lot of these cases, but it is such, it is so common and close to them that they don't even care. Right. Do you want to be talking... a bit more specific in this case? Yeah just the way they talk about the weather and the Mm -hmm. melting of the ice the rivers are no longer safe like these are things like people easily die from these things all the time they could not like it's just not it's just common talk to them this is after church regular speak because death lives so closely and it ties back to that the honesty that the pastoral requires absolutely there's yeah there's you can't dance around it you can't hide from it Death does not dress up in pretty dresses. That's true. And obviously there's a whole thing about tying church to death, right? Mm-hmm. The, this whole thing of you come out and you've just been sermoned at for like two hours about Jesus who literally transcended death. And how do they transcend death is by their association with nature, right? Or yeah. s- assuming that, yeah. um, that that's what it is. Um and I really like. And it's like they say, due to the these men see each other once a week, they could be best friends, and one of them could die without them knowing it. The yeah. only way they know any of their news is by the comings and goings of to church. Yeah, absolutely. And to reemphasize that point as well, like the lack of food or the potential lack of food. I tell yeah. you that we shall have a lean year, right? You don't know, right? You don't know. Um, you literally don't. Exactly. Right. And industrialization hasn't hit this part of the world yet. Globalization <laughs> so, is just a far off dream. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It'll come soon. But yeah, not. Um, yeah, not quite. Um, I really like as well. This is such a small passage of what you read, but I really like here. Um, oh, yeah. When they're smoking after the hour and a half of restraint began to smoke with evident satisfaction. Just 
using the metaphor, using the imagery of smoking, in this case, smoking is pipe, as a way of showing the limitations and the sacrifices that you have to make when living on this particular, um, in this particular area is, I think, a really nice touch, right? Um, because mm. smoking is not something that you ever think about, right? Um, or at least not in books much. People just get out a cigarette. But in this case, Imon really wanted to emphasize the fact that this is a restraint on his end, right? And so you just came out of church, you want to be a good man of God, or you want to be a good um, person. And so you're showing- Kumbaya, you're showing... my lord. Kumbaya. <laughs> also, I want to mention last point. Your accent is, you may say it's horrible, but fuck me if I haven't heard someone speak exactly the same way in just their regular accent that comes exactly from the Lac saint jean region. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I talk a lot like uh, my math teacher. He would, so, so. he would talk like this. He was a great man. I genuinely, he was a good man. He was an honest man. May uh, he talked like this. <laughs> he had trouble with the number three. Yep, classic. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Um, okay, the next passage I want to bring up is on page twenty-four. Um, in hmm. this case. So I wrote here just as a note, right, on the psychology of the Chapdelens. Um, but it's more on the father in this case, but through the father, um, the whole family, because that's how patriarchy works. Um, okay. Whoa, patriarchy! Oh, yeah, we're not escaping it in this book. Um, you know, nobody escapes the patriarchy. <laughs> <laughs> so the passage goes, it's just a paragraph. Quote, it may be that the Chapdelens so were thinking, and each in his own fashion, the father with the inconquerable optimism of a man who knows himself strong and believes himself wise, the mother with a gentle resignation, the others, the younger ones, in a less definite way and without bitterness, seeing before them a long life in which they could not miss attaining happiness. Um, Maria stole an occasional glance at Eutrop Gagnon, but she quickly turned away, for she always surprised his humbly worshipping eyes. Um, for a year she had become used to his frequent visits, nor felt displeasure when every Sunday evening added to the family circle his brown face, this brown face that was continually so patient and good-humoured, but the short absent of a month, absence of a month had not left things the same, for she had brought home to the fireside an undefined feeling that a page of her life was turned in which he would have no share. Damn. I thought this passage was kind of, I thought this passage was kind of interesting. Yeah. You said, damn, but like, what, what did you want to say about it? I don't know. I just think it was well-written. I just like it. I just think it's neat. <laughs> so it's interesting. I the, the main reason why I picked it out is first, because it like concisely, I think points to each of the characters right he like mm. distills down the characters so well um unconquerable father um a gently resigned yeah. mother right Jesus cool yeah like that that hurts that hurts, that hurts. <laughs> um and the children who just kind of have their uh life mapped out ahead of them but are still going to be happy right because you know they don't they know that they're not going to be lacking in this case of for anything so they're they're not unhappy in this in this particular life and they know that probably even if they wanted to they won't be able to live the big life in the city or whatever mm -hmm. so again kind of happy resignation um make do and, with what you got exactly and, and i okay. feel like but i think that like as far as storytelling is concerned that's kind of what's interesting is that you then get immediately after in the in the next paragraph, you get Maria's version of settling, right? Oh, she's interested in the neighbor and the neighbor boy who's exactly like her father. But then you get the switch saying like, oh, but she's going to turn a page. Like she's going to be different from everyone else by actually going beyond that, right? Or at least uh, not um, being satisfied with her trip. Ultimately, we know she would end up with him. But I think the passage still holds true of satisfaction and happiness. I think mm. she does it for the greater good, so to speak, of her family and tradition because she 
thinks that that's what's going to be right. But again, this comes back, I think, to the element of sacrifice that I was talking about at the beginning, where she's like, the book already established that this is not what she wants, that she's moved past this, but -hmm. she'll still have to settle for it for the perceived good that it will do her family and her father Mm -hmm. right? by being with her father, basically, (laughs) which slap. (laughs) Damn. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's, it slaps, right. I'm, I'm not going to lie that these are, these are the reasons why it's a classic. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It doesn't pull any punches. Um, Nor should it. No. Right. Um, All right. Your passage is, I think you have another one again on not far from that on page 26. Oh, that's one of yours, I thought. Oh, is it? We can do yours and then we can do my next one because my next one is also on agriculture. It's on farming a bit. Okay. Uh, well, let's see. So we can dance between the two a bit? Yeah, sure. Because they both hit on um, the same themes. And I think that's actually like, we can't talk about pastoral without talking about farming, baby. That is true, right? Uh, oh, yes. Okay. So this one is kind of the two in one, because as you'll notice from my notes, Mac, I mentioned window sitting as mm. something that I wanted to talk about. And this passage kind of touches on both, right? Um, both um, the agriculture and uh, window sitting. So this is on the bottom of 26. A dozen times in the course of the day, Maria and her mother opened the window to feel the softness of the air, listened to the tinkle of water running from the last drifts on the higher slopes, or hearken to the mighty roar telling the exulting Peribonka was free, uh, telling that the exulting Peribonka was free, and hurrying to the lake, a freight of ice flows from the remote north. Um... Chapdelaine seated himself that evening on the doorstep for his smoke. A stirring memory brought the remark, Francois will soon be passing, he said. Uh, He said that perhaps he would come to see us. Maria replied with a scarce, audible yes, and blessed the shadow hiding her face. So the whole passage I thought was kind of interesting for two reasons. One, it's interesting within the context of the winter, right? And how Mm -hmm. everything both actually and metaphorically freezes right Mm. um and throughout the novel i feel you get this sense that you know agriculture despite traditionally being associated with well again a very traditional way of life and conservative values right uh the way that it's framed by the characters is that it's their way of existing and being and being able to actually have any kind of movement and any kind of reaction in life right because when they Mm -hmm. don't do that the characters are depicted as extremely static right and it's only when agriculture kind of arrives that that you know now there's actually stuff and you get that in um in chapdelaine's father chapdelaine's um uh Uh, quote here where he says that other people are soon going to be passing by right suddenly contact is there again um and we'll be able to do things and change things and maria's like fuck i don't want to see francois (laughs) (laughs) Um, ah fuck it's that francois (laughs) bitch (laughs) but the reason why i also wanted to bring up this passage is because of the mention of the window and the Mm. window i think is kind of cool because it's a recurring image throughout the book. I don't know if you noticed this one in any of the passages that you read, but the window is, of course, like a very powerful symbol of, you know, simultaneously framing Maria's life, right? Uh, in this case, and telling her, okay, well, she's currently a homebody and she could only see this greater outdoors from the constraints of her particular home, right? She only has one space through which to appreciate and go out uh into the wider world but as other literary critics have pointed out and which i find kind of interesting because she's always at that window right it becomes a way for other people especially the men of the village and their neighbors to look at her right and to frame her in a specific way right um it provides an outlet for the male gaze of the village right so to speak um who have this point of 
contact for Maria in her supposedly natural state as a housewife in this case. So I thought that was kind of cool, like the window as a framing, both literally and metaphorically, right, of what Maria is supposed to be, right, or what her dreams are. Uh, so yeah, mm-hmm. I just wanted to bring that up. I don't know if you have anything to say about either of these things that I brought up, but I thought that well, was Well, I like kind of the cool. use of the window, just because <laughs> windows and doors, as always, are gateways and viewways from safety and comfort out into the wild, as it were. Yeah. So I like the use of the window in that sense. Like the opening and the closing of it, especially the opening of it to let the cold air in, the freshness of the air. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. So my passage, speaking of agriculture and what it brings, is on page 61. All right. Let's talk about farming. Yeah. In five days, all the hay was cut. And the drought persisted on the morning of the sixth day. They began to break and scatter the cocks they intended lodging in the barn before night. The scythes had done their work and the forks came into play. They threw down the cocks, spread the hay in the sun, and toward the end of the afternoon, when dry, heaped it anew in piles of such a size that a man could just lift one with a single motion to the level of a well-filled hay cart. Shaz Yijin pulled gallantly between the shafts. The cart was swallowed up in the barns, stopped beside the mow, and once again the forks were plunged into the hard-packed hay raising a thick mat of it with strain of wrist and back and unloaded it to one side. By the end of the week, the hay, well dried and of excellent color, was all under cover. The men stretched themselves and took long breaths, knowing the fight was over and won. And I just love the language of this and how it portrays Mm. the act of farming as this almost like noble cause. He didn't just pull between the shots. He pulled gallantly the strain of the wrist wrist and back as they pulled the fight was over and won there's like again sort of talking about how you were their stagnant life without farming when Mm. they are they almost emulate knights from stories i was just about to say like that that sounds like a medieval knight right he's gallant he's noble he Oh, and yeah, I think it really again good. just speaks to the language of the original book and how well the translation was done that this imagery is kept in the novel because mm. I think I just love the way it portrays these farmers it shows it again really shows the virtue of what they do they yeah. are it almost like this is a just cause of farming which it is we need food to live yeah, for sure all farmers live through a just cause oh absolutely right um I like also this is just me because I like to see these things in novels or just writing in general, where they part of the passage, you said the scythes had done their work and the forks came into play, right? Yeah. Where the objects or the farming objects kind of seem to have their own agency, so to speak, mm-hmm. like the beyond just the, the, the men at work in this case, which obviously is a huge part, like the farm seems to have, or the farm things seem to have a life of their own. Right. And I mm-hmm. feel like a phrasing like that is kind of interesting and displays that as well. Mm. Oh, for sure. And I think like there's just the farming in general is really interesting. So would mm. you know in the novel when they refer to cocks, they're obviously referring to the roosters, right? I would say, uh, yeah, that's how I saw it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, when they... and I, again, like this could be reaching, but I definitely think there's definitely mm. some masculine imagery at play with how often cocks are mentioned in this passage oh you think do you think farming (laughs) and agriculture is often associated with masculinity well especially this like just how much he talks about the cocks oh yeah like this man is too clever and too smart to not be aware of the the imagery i guess this might just be a translation thing like this might have been different in french but yeah i'd have to look very interesting I still think it's very interesting. Like it just, even if it isn't, there's still this very strong play on like a farming as this noble masculine thing. Like it is something you do. It is some, it is a fight. Yeah. It is a battle to win. I don't know what I expected, but I typed in scatter the cock to see if, <laughs> if it like brought up any particular type of farming metaphor or farming expression that I didn't know oh, of. And no, fun. it just brought up porn. Nice. <laughs> but um i'm just trying to see 
yeah, I'd have to find a French version <laughs> and see like what the actual it is. But yeah, I think you're absolutely right in this case. Um, like the masculinity element is a hundred percent there. Um, but again, it's masculine, but it, much like you would see with the knightly tales, right? There is they're they're not like stereotypically masculine. There's always something in the language that says that there's something still not stereotypically masculine about them, right? Um, let's see. Yeah, well, obviously throwing down the cock, as you were saying. Um, uh, where was it? Um, yeah, well, just the idea of being gallant and mm -hmm. uh, and not being necessarily always violent towards the thing, which is generally how like farming is sometimes portrayed. Um but yeah, anyway, I, I miss I can't find the passage that I wanted to talk about, so I'll just skip it. Um, anything else you wanted to mention about that, or would you want to go on to your final quote? Um, no, let's go on to my final one, because I think this one is also very interesting. Mm -hmm. And so this one is page 120. So we're really going to push ourselves to close to the end of the novel. Let's go. And so this is happening when Maria is talking with one of her suitors. Maria. This is one of the men who... Yeah. Maria. And she's, he's trying to proposition himself as a viable candidate. And I think it's really interesting what he does to do that is, it is true enough that I am not rich, but I have two lots of my own, paid for out and out, and you know the soil is good. I shall work on it all spring, Take the stumps out of the large field below the ridge of rock. Put up some fences, and be May, there will be a fine field ready for seeding. I shall sow 130 bushels, Maria. 130 bushels of wheat, barley, and oats, without reckoning an acre of mixed grain for cattle. All the seed, the best seed grain, I am going to buy at Rabaval, settling for it on the spot. I have the money put aside. I shall pay cash without running into debt to a soul. And if only we have an average season, there will be a fine crop to harvest. Just think of it, Maria, 130 bushels of good seed and first rate land. And then the summer before the haymaking, and then again before the harvest, will be the best chance for building a nice, tight, warm little house, all of Tamarack. I have the wood ready, cut and piled behind my barn. My brother will help me, perhaps as Dras and Dabe as well, when they get home. Next winter, I shall go to the shanties, taking a horse with me, and in the spring, I shall bring back not less than $200 in my pocket. Then, should you be willing to wait so long for me, would be the time. And he goes on and on. And obviously, like, it's obviously this pitch doesn't quite work as we see in the novel. Like, she's bored listening to it. But she's I bored. do think it's interesting that yeah. we always had this idea that political marriage the bartering for marriages was a thing of the distant past mm. meanwhile this happened a little over 100 years ago and it still happens today like the economics of marriage and my grandmother yeah <laughs> the economics of marriage within the pastoral is still such a large thing that i think is like good to talk about oh yeah and coming back to the idea of masculinity that you were talking about dude provides and at the same time, right, what what kind of image can you think of of spreading the seed? Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, the seed my is God. strong. The dude the seed is strong many times. Dude. His seed is strong. Like, he's not just talking about the crops in this case, folks. <laughs> in, 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 <laughs> in case you couldn't tell. In case you couldn't tell. In case um, you were stupid like me or Patrick. <laughs> No, but exactly like the idea, like, I think this definitely does come back to the economics of it, right? Mm. Because you produce more children, um, you're, you keep the tradition going in this case, but you also allow your farm to be produced and expand and you get, you know, success as a farmer because you have children, right? So the seed produces more seeds and blah, 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 right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, definitely in this case. So by the way, she's the one that, he, she is bored, but he's the one that she would go with, finally. Um, like this guy. <laughs> um, but yeah, just absolutely nailing it and just saying like, hey, 
to be honest, if someone would tell me today, like, marry mm-hmm. me and I'll give you land and be like, and a horse, I was like, yes, immediately, right? At the cost of houses today, I would absolutely say yes. <laughs> <laughs> to land in a horse in a heartbeat <laughs> oh uh, god but no that's really good and obviously there's the the cash element which yeah exactly just this whole yeah. and like yeah she's not particularly interested but it's the fact like this is what most people's opening pitch would be in the time mm. the monetary yeah. pitch yeah absolutely but it's also like I, the to bring it back to the idea of of um, religion in this case, right? Uh, without running into debt to a soul, the idea of debt is something that's like that permeates religion for uh, and religious thought for a long time, right? Not not bringing people into debt, um, right? Jesus whipped bankers because they brought people into debt, right? So there's this moral um there's this moral like kind of imperative of not being into debt and having good finances that is tied into religion and of course the whole pastoral theme that uh we're talking about in this case so i think yeah Mm -hmm. this is an excellent passage that again kind of brings together all of these elements in really interesting ways yeah nice i don't know if you had anything to add to that particular passage but uh no works for me i like it all right so I just want to end off here with a bit of a bit of a word on the legacy, but we've already done like yes. a long episode in this case. So we'll 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 stop it after. But um you know, we've been focusing a lot on the language of this book, and rightfully so, because it's really well written. Um but uh Maria Chabdelaine critic, Nicole Deschamps, who's done a lot of work on uh on the book and on Louis Aimant has, I think, rightfully pointed out that more than anything, Maria Chapdelaine has kind of been ignored for its literary merits over time, right? While it would have mm. been so when it was first published, it's been kind of co-opted or it was co-opted for such a long time politically and ideologically um, as a kind of ideal worthy of emulation for the Quebecois people that, you know, despite the beauty of the book, it's been kind of marred so to speak by this co-option right into Mm -hmm. ideological uh purity right and crystallization and i i agree with her to say that it's kind of unfortunate like again you can't really decide like how a book's going to be used right it just kind of becomes a phenomenon or not it just is yeah yeah but i do agree i do think i agree with her that you know for all for all of the ideas that are interesting in the book, it is rather unfortunate that that's what, for a long time, the Quebecois people and Quebecois ideologues would kind of hang on to as an ideal because it did very much you know, stagnate right, culturally and politically Quebec for quite some time, despite being a groundbreaking cultural uh, cultural item in this case, that is worthy of attention and has been worthy of a lot of literary attention and cultural attention for quite some time, right, since its publication. Mm. Um, and yeah, so as to, to put it in the words of Deschamps, right, the the legacy of Maria Chapdelaine has unfortunately turned what was a tragic tale of resignation, right? Again, Chapdelaine is not happy about this. We know it from the beginning <laughs> that she's not She's resigning herself to this. She's sacrificing. Mm -hmm. And right. So this tale of resignation and misery was turned into like a national collective destiny, which not great. No, (laughs) not at all. Right. Um, Anyway, and there would in the 60s as the quiet revolution happened and as literature in Quebec thawed, so to speak, um, there would be like very overt reactions to Maria Chapdelaine, which I hope to get to on the show someday. Like um, Marie Claire Blais wrote a book in 1965 called Une saison dans la vie d'Emmanuel, which translates literally to a season in the life of Emmanuel, um, where she kind of takes up the rural dream that Maria Chapdelaine had come to represent by that time and just destroys it. 
in the book, right? It becomes a tale of lice and abuse and incest and pederasty and greed. It's disgusting, right? Absolutely horrible world to live in, according to Bleh, right? But you <laughs> see the shifting, um, you see the shifting mentality vis-a-vis -vis that type of world through reactions, literary and otherwise, to what Maria Chapdelaine came to represent, despite not being a book that is actually about that, right? Um, yeah, I felt like that was kind of a good thing to mention yeah. in this case. I don't know, like, what kind of final thoughts you might have on the book. I mean, I might have final thoughts, I think, are related to your final thoughts and just this horrible this horrible thing of literature where you have these truly beautiful books that are just marred by what people do to them. Right. Yeah. This wonderful story has been co-opted by people who don't understand what it's actually about, probably, or who don't know what who the don't fuck care. they're talking about. <laughs> yeah, who right. don't care. And now you you're say left like with this beautifully right. written book that could probably be a piece of early feminist literature if they wanted it to that mm -hmm. just isn't but it, it is kind of interesting that it's still taught in french class mm -hmm. right like i had to read this for school um my teacher was good to note that it was not a celebration of this type of life so there is <laughs> there has been a kind of shift oh, oh sorry there has been a kind of shift away from that interpretation um but yeah that it's it's place as a lightning rod for political um for political meaning has not shifted necessarily um it's just a different type of political meaning which yeah do with that information what you will uh all right anything else you want to add before we call it a day i think that's it for me i can't think of anything else at the moment no be pastoral folks it's a good life to live <laughs> exactly Abandon the city, embrace tradition of the farm. <laughs> That's the lesson for and today. Embrace the rule. <laughs> That's obviously the lesson of Mary Chapdelaine. Just embrace the rule. Marry your father. Mm. <laughs> uh, um, all right, but thanks everyone for listening. You can support in all the ways that we mentioned at the top, either through Patreon. Just giving a review of the show is always great. Um, you can send like one-time donations through PayPal. That's always great. But all of this is totally optional. We're continuing the show regardless. Um, it's going to be free, independent. And yeah, send us an email um, letting us know what you'd like us to cover. Um, mm -hmm. If there's any particular uh, person that you'd like us to have perhaps on the show and trying to set up some interviews. Um, it's a bit tricky now uh, with the new job, but starting to get um, like bit of a hang back into that uh so yeah look out for those i'll be releasing some soon anyway and yeah just tell people about the show review it and yeah i think that's pretty much it thanks everyone mm -hmm. for listening and we'll see you next time on uh, historia canadiana cheers everyone cheers <laughs>